So I know that um, you, were, you were probably read that this lesson was going to be about community and connection. It, well, it's not. <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, the title of my talk today is, What Are You For? And that'll make sense probably somewhere in the middle. So it's okay. Um, when, I was a, when I was a child, my mom taught me a lesson that I remember to this day, and which is significant because uh, my mom passed away when I was just five years old. But this, this lesson was good. She taught me that there is no spot where God is not. You've heard that, right? Sure. But when you really take that apart, really look at it, that is an extremely powerful statement. And when you can truly take it in and truly believe it, it is an even more powerful statement. Now, for many years, I was seeking God, okay? Even though, and it was kind of funny, I remember the day, I remember it pretty well uh, that day because she was in the garden and she was working and she was raking and, 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 you know, working around the garden. And she told me, you know, that there is no spot where God is not. And I was very determined to find a spot that God wasn't. <laughs> is God in the flowers? Yep, God's in the flowers. Is God, is God in the grass? Yeah, God's in the grass. Is God in the dirt? Yep, God's in the dirt. Is God in this rock? Yeah, God's in the rock. And what I know is, and what I've learned, is that that, that little idea carried me back to this place. Because I was in search for a long time of, of trying to find God or trying to understand God. Because I forgot that there is no spot where God is not. Because if there is no spot where God is not, then God must be in me, right? Of course. Dr. Holmes writes, The only thing in our lives that needs to be corrected is the feeling that we are separate from God. The feeling, because it's never tr the truth is not there, of course. We are always connected with God, but we have this feeling that maybe we're not. And then we start acting according to that feeling, right? The thing is, is that if there is no spot where God is not, then that would mean that the only thing in our lives that needs to be corrected is the feeling that we're separate from anything. If God's everything and everywhere, then the only thing that needs to be corrected is the idea that we're separate from anything that exists. That's a big idea for a little five-year-old, okay? But as I, as I went out and started um, checking out different uh, teachings and uh, Christian teachings and so on and so forth, they, they gave me, they fed me to a certain point, but it didn't really, didn't really happen for me. And then I came here. I was about 40 years old, and I came here, and Dr. Carolyn was giving a lesson, and she says, there is no spot where God is not. <laughs> Hooked me right there, you know. And then everything else started to fall into place and make some sense to me. It was not until I started um, my practitioner studies here at the center that I found out where that had come from for her. You see, she would, and I know some of you already know this, but she would, um, with my grandfather, go and listen to Dr. Holmes. My um, grandfather was a divine scientist of the Divine Science Church. And so putting that all together just, I mean, it gives me kind of the shiver wivers, you know.
um, Connie did a wonderful meditation this morning. And one of the things she, she reminded us of is that each one of us are here on purpose. There are no mistakes. And each one of us are guided here, like here today, on purpose. And so I, I appreciate you all coming here. But you're supposed to be here. So that's a good thing. Okay. So with all of that, I'm going to switch around. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. But what I'd like to do is I'm going to take a left turn here. And we're going to talk about my adventures at uh, Silomar last, um, last month. Now, Silomar, um, the Centers for Spiritual Living, put on a uh, retreat every summer. And they've been doing this retreat all over the country in different places. And I think last year was in Park City, Utah. And I went to that with a few people here from the center. There's about 100 people, 110 people, something like that. So this year, they decided to have it at Asilomar. Now, Asilomar, for many, many years, was the place of, the, um, of our, uh, I don't want to say convention, but it was of the conference, of the uh, CSL conference. And they stopped going there for, I think it was almost six years. Well, they brought it back. And they, you know, they put, put it out there, and I think within one day, they sold all the, all the tickets to it. And so they had to expand it. So they expanded it to like 200, right? And they kept expanding it. We had 500 people there. It was like a CSL Woodstock. <laughs> it was great. It was so much fun. And, and we had, I think, 11 or 12 people from, the, from this center there as well. And oh, we just had the best time. Um, and what I, what I, I gleaned a lot of things there, and we're going to share some of those things. But uh, one of the things I can tell you is this teaching is expanding. It was amazing. And it was amazing to see how many young people are in leadership roles in this teaching throughout throughout the country. It was, it was just beautiful. And we had uh, like, um, well, 12 different workshops choices over a three-day period. You couldn't go to all 12, but you could pick and choose. And some of those workshops were like um, ranging from shadow work, okay, which I did a little bit of that, uh, to creating loving relationships, to how to reframe your life, and then even um, turning your affirmations into chants. That, that was led by Karen Drucker, so that was pretty cool, too. So it was just, it was amazing. And, and then each morning, we had uh, morning um, practices that you, could, that you could choose. You could choose yoga or tai chi or, um, or uh, what else? Oh, and just some meditations. Okay, and in the evening, they had yoga again. They had a bonfire on the beach, people just uh, kicking back and enjoying that. The spiritual drum circles, and also open mic night, which was pretty fun to, uh, to participate. Actually, I didn't participate much. I just listened. But, excuse me, I have a need for this. And rather than use the sleeve of my shirt, I think I'll use this here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Did you live people see that? I guess I don't know. <laughs> The music. Oh, man. The music was great. Had seven different, uh, very, very talented artists that, that um, just expressed this beautiful music. And we sang every morning, and we sang every night, and we, we are just so spiritually fed this group of 500 people. And it was just a really good indication of what could be for everyone. It was wonderful. Um, now, we had 11 speakers. And they would speak in the morning, they'd speak in the evening. And I had only, and I've been in this a long time, I think I only had heard the, uh, two of those speakers that spoke. They were all new and fresh and, and with wonderful ideas and very different perspectives of, of our teaching and, and, and things. It was just great. One of the speakers, however, really caught my attention, and that's what I want to share with you a little bit. And that was Dr. David Bruner. And he's a, um, uh, 
the uh, minister for the San Jose um, Center for Spiritual Living. Now, as many of you know, the CSL vision is creating a world that works for everyone. Well, gosh, that's a pretty lofty goal, don't you think? That, uh, you kind of go, wow, that, that's a world that works for everyone? I mean, when we look at how things uh, look out there right now, oh, man. But he shared some things, and, and from the things that he shared, I began to see how this is a possibility. He talked about the difference between being for something as opposed to being anti-something. And the power behind being for something as opposed to being anti-something. Now, doesn't that make sense? Really. I mean, when we're writing an affirmation, right, and we're wanting to make a change, we don't write about what, we're, what we are critical of, what we don't want. What do we do? What we want, what we're for, right? That's where it's at. When we do spiritual mind treatments, we aren't complaining and, and, and talking about what we're against. We're stating what we are for, and even more than that, as if it's already here, right? That it's already here, because it is. Well, gosh, that makes a lot of sense. His message was, stop complaining. <laughs> By complaining, we're really just wasting our energy. Whether it's complaining about the politics, complaining about whatever it might be in your life. There's a, um, I work at, in, at Round Table Pizza, okay? And um, we're working on a big project. And this project has to, we're a franchisee, so the project had to be run through the franchisor, right? And, and when, we were very excited about this project that we wanted to do. And we ran it through uh, the franchisor, and, and, you know, they didn't like it. They, they, didn't, they didn't even want to really hear or see it, right? And so my immediate reaction is, you dummies, you don't know what you're... I, I, of course, get into the mode of being critical. Why? Because I'm dealing at the level of the ego, and, uh, and I want to let them know how wrong they are about it, right? <laughs> so you can imagine how short that conversation went. <laughs> not good. Not good. However, taking a step back, taking a little space, remembering that if I am for something, rather than being and being critical about that other entity, whatever it might be, I need to come from a place of being for. And so I called them back. And I said, you know, I'd really like to meet in person because I don't think we're really communicating well off of the, the emails and, and the phone conversations. Let's meet in person. And they agreed to do so. See, they're working on a similar project, right? And so we met. And th before that, of course, I prepared myself uh, spiritually with treatment and knowing that I am simply expressing from a place of love, from a place of connection. And you know what? If it doesn't work out, that's okay. Letting go of the consequences. Letting go of the ego part of it. And so we went into the meeting. We were able to Really, I brought my designer in. I brought a virtual reality computer screen of, of exactly what the place would look like. We explained why we wanted to do what we wanted to do. And you know what we found out? They loved it. And the issues that they were having with the same type of project, we addressed a lot of them. And then we began to work together and collaborate. And by the end of the meeting, we actually hugged each other. <laughs> it's true. And I had all the kinds of different other franchisors calling me on the phone on my ride back, you know, asking me, what happened, what happened, what happened? I said, it went great. 
We're working together. We're making it happen. And it's going to be better than ever. And they were all very excited. That simple shift of the need to be right, that simple shift moving from being critical to being for something and creating a vision makes all the difference in the world. Okay. Thing is that, here's, here's the thing, and, and again, Connie's meditation, there she is, meditation this morning was wonderful, was right in line with it. Um, when we're triggered about something in the world, we may not be understanding that the thing that we're triggered by only exists within us, within ourselves. We are creating this battle, if you will, within ourselves. That's the only place it exists. Connie ta- I gave the example of a glass of water with mud in it and how anger and angst and, and jealousy and all those things that we start off with a nice clear glass of water and then all those different thoughts keep adding mud to it and it gets muddied up. We do that to ourselves. And she pointed out that nobody can put mud in that water except for ourselves. We put the mud in the water. So it's through our thinking that this, that this cloud happens within ourselves. This angst happens within ourselves. The judgment and the stories that we tell ourselves about others, about people we don't even really know, they're very destructive. And they are not going to take us to a place, to a world that really works for everyone. Now, one of the things um, David Bruner talked about was this idea of a wristband, okay? And, and what he said is he's got this wristband that he, that he, puts, that he put on his wrist. And that any time he complains about something, or has a judgment about something or someone that he, a prejudgment about something or someone. He has to take that band and he switches it to the other wrist. <clears throat> and <clears throat> his goal is to go for 21 days without having to move the wristband. Now, it's not just what you say. It's what you think, too. So you can even have the thought and think it then you got to move the wristband. <laughs> that was 36 days ago. I haven't had to move the wristband for about three or four hours. Thank you. This wristband and I have had quite a relationship. <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, I made the mistake of, of letting my family and my friends, and now all of you, and all of you, and the people I work with, in on this whole wristband deal, Okay. And it's been pretty interesting because they've been very helpful to let me know <laughs> when I need to switch it, you know. I, I overheard people that, you know, in, in the boardroom, uh, I, I had gone out to get a glass of water and, I, and I, came, I was coming back and I could hear him, did he change his wristband? <laughs> oh, man. And then we drove down to Santa Clara the other day and... I had to change it so much because it was really heavy traffic, you know, <laughs> that I actually had to just take it off. My wife just says, she says, just take it off for a while, then we'll put it back on, you know. I have thrown this thing across the room. 
I've taken it off no more than usually a few hours. Only to remember, however, the significance of it. And the fact that I am committed to making this happen for myself. I really am. More than anything, this wristband has been my teacher. It has brought into my awareness my complaining and my judgments on a day in and day out, minute by minute basis. And what I can tell you about it is I'm getting better. Really. I mean, uh, the other, uh, yesterday I probably only had to move it two or three times. Okay, which is, compared to when I first started, that's really good. <laughs> really good. And, and so what I'm, what's happening is I'm beginning to train myself to approach any and everything I see, not from a point of complaining about it, but how can I, re how can I reshape that and how can I restate it as something that I'm for? How can I be supportive of something? And it's working. It really is. And it's hard. It really is. It is. Um, but I have the full support of my family and friends, and now all of you too. So. But some things, you know, some things I really had no idea about. And one of the things is, I, my family and I have always worked with um, people that are homeless, okay? We've uh, fed them, worked to feed them and, and help out, and always had a, a lot of compassion and empathy for those that are homeless. But what I realized about myself is that I'm also in judgment of that at times. That guy doesn't look like he should be homeless, why are, they, why are they here asking for money with that sign like that? Don't they know they can get fed over here or whatever? All these judgments. And I begin to make stories up in my mind of people that I have no idea about at all. I'm just making stuff up. And yet judging them based on the stuff that I'm making up. There's a, um, I saw a, a, a um, YouTube. It was kind of interesting because it was about this guy um, and, and a girl. The, uh, this young lady is sitting on a, a park bench. And I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to explain it. But she's sitting on the park bench and she's sketching and she's drawing these beautiful pictures, you know. And this guy comes and he sits down next to her. He's got his backpack and he's got his running shorts on and stuff. And he kind of looks over and he's, he starts making comments about how, what a great, uh, how beautiful it was and, and introducing himself and so on and so forth. And she doesn't even look up. She doesn't even give him the time of day, right? And so he gets frustrated. He stands up and he's kind of ticked off and he goes out for a run and... and she notices that when he gets up, he's uh, kind of angry. And so she writes a little note and leaves it on his backpack. And then she, she leaves. And then he comes back from his run, and he picks up the backpack, and there's a note. And the note basically says, I'm very sorry if I offended you in any way, but I am deaf. And in his mind, he had worked up a whole story, a whole scenario. Oh, she thinks she's so good looking, you know, she doesn't really care, you know, whatever it might be. I know none of us ever do anything like that, <laughs> right? But this is part of that whole idea that's connected with this, this idea of prejudging. If we want to have, create a world that works for everyone, we need to move ourselves. I have no idea where I am now. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so what have I learned through this whole process? I've learned a lot. See, I thought, oh, piece of cake, no problem. I don't complain hardly ever. <coughs> 
I learn that I complain more than I realize, and I judge more than I realize. But I am getting better. I am more aware of the judgments I place on people, on organizations, on politicians, or whatever it might be. I'm learning to shift my stating what I'm for rather than what I'm against. But more than anything, I'm learning that the change that has to take place is here. It's not out there. It's here. Marianne Williamson writes, Until we have met the monsters in ourselves, we keep trying to slay them in the outer world. And we find that we cannot, for all darkness in the world stems from darkness in the heart. And it is there that we must do our work. So it, it is true that I still have a lot of work to do on myself. It's an ongoing process. I'm learning not to be so tough on myself either. I don't know if you uh, heard Reverend um, Christine's lesson last week, but if you didn't, I highly recommend you listen to it. It was beautiful. It was great. And she had a quote in her lesson that I would like to share with you this morning. It reminds us that, we, that while we are perfect in one sense, that we're all human, and we're humanly flawed, and it's a good thing, it's not a bad thing. It reads, Dear human, you've got it all wrong. You didn't come here to master unconditional love. And this is where you came from, and this is where you'll return. You came here to learn personal love. Universal love, messy love, sweaty love, crazy love, broken love, whole love, infused with divinity. Live through the grace of stumbling. Demonstrate through the beauty of messing up often. You didn't come here to be perfect. You already are. You came here to be gorgeously human, flawed and fabulous, and rising again into remembering. But unconditional love? Stop telling that story. Love and truth doesn't need any adjectives. It doesn't require modifiers. It doesn't require the condition of perfection. It only asks you to show up and do your best. That you stay present and feel and feel fully. That you shine and fly and laugh and cry and hurt and heal and fall and get back up and play and work and live and die as you. It's enough. It's plenty. And that was written by Courtney Walsh. So people have asked me, when am I going to take this wristband off? I'm not sure. I'm going to, I'm going to keep working on it because I'm learning and I'm growing, so it's good for me. It's a continual practice, and I'm going to keep doing it. Through all of this, the greatest truth that I've come to remember is that we don't have to create a place that works for everyone. It's already here. Our call is to reveal it. And we do that by stop complaining. Namaste. No